Now go up there. Okay. okay, good morning. Glad y'all are here. Um, announcements this morning. Um, regular men's and women's recovery meetings. Um, if you know someone, send them there. All the information is on the screen. Um, the maternity home in town um, is, they do donations. This is their baby bottle drive. Um, what I do with mine is I leave it in my car door and because we have three kids and so whenever we go through a drive through or whatever all of my change goes in there and we can fill it up in like two months maybe but anyway if you're interested um, which you should be it's an amazing cause um, they have oh gosh six girls now I think right mm -hmm. uh huh there's six with several babies um, yesterday they had a some of the other girls some of the girls got their kids this weekend and it was full it was full house last month so anyway you can make a difference and they need volunteers so like if you want to go up there and love on babies and watch them or, or teach moms how to you know cook or whatever the Lord has blessed you with you can totally help so grab a baby bottle before you leave tonight we actually have I have a party from 4 to 6 for single moms we have a class called Embrace Grace and um, we just uh, let single moms know that first of all their identity is in Jesus and um, that they're not alone there are people in this community so we've got a, several ladies that are going to help them out tonight and um, we've got they get a crock pot so that party's from 4 to 6 here if you want to come for that what else? Friday afternoon, um, like at 4 to 5, we're going to do a family Thanksgiving. So if anybody wants to come, if you don't have family, that's fine. Um, come to our family Thanksgiving here at 4. Let's say 4, but it might be 5 before okay. we eat. Just bring whatever your favorite dish is. If you don't have a place to cook it, you can come early and cook it here. I think that's it. Right? So let's, let's pray and let's invite the Lord in and, and worship, okay? Um, Lord, thank you so much for this time that we have to gather together in your name. And Lord, I just pray that you are glorified by our worship that we have to offer you, by the reading of your word. Um, help us to lay down all the cares and the burdens that we have going on and uh, lift those up to you, just giving them to you and not taking them with us when we leave here, Lord, but knowing that you're in charge. Um, yeah, we just pray that you're honored and glorified by this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and worship together. So uh, if you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, then stay seated. That's fine. Whatever. Change it up in the middle. It's all good. Um, whatever it takes for you to be comfortable and to worship God, that, that's where I want you. So let's go ahead and get things rolling, shall we? All right, we're going to start off with Jesus Forever. Yeah. 
full of those storms uh, but he's always with us and his love never fails us and that is uh, just the best thing ever <laughs> all right let's sing reckless love still your love fought for me because the Bible tells us that we were enemies of God at one point in time every single one of us uh, and uh, God didn't let that stop him 
you know, or where you would normally just go ahead and ride a person off. He doesn't. I'm grateful for that because that is genuinely amazing grace.
First of all, I just want to say it's good to see you guys. I'm grateful for the chance to worship with you guys, lead you guys in worship, even though that's really not uh, the main thing God's placed in my life. Um, I love doing it anyway. Um, I'll let you guys know what's uh, been going on to some degree uh, with me in, in the last week because uh, I was invited about three weeks ago almost. Um, uh, a The guy who is the church planting pastor at Stonewater Church, and, and that's the church that my wife and I uh, were sent out of to start Live Oak. So they're what, what's commonly called our sending church. And since uh, Joey White is church planning pastor, um, he was very instrumental in that. At any rate, he contacted various people that he knows uh, who are in the ministry, some of whom are people like me who planted out of Stonewater, some of whom just have connections, some of whom he just recently met. Um, but regardless, he invited us to this, um, for lack of a better term, of pastor's retreat. Not everyone was a pastor, so that's not exactly a, a accurate title. But anyway, um, we went, and uh, it was a good time. It really was. Uh, there were 12 of us there, and um, so it was a pretty uh, intimate time. I, got, took, I, I only knew three of those guys in advance, and to say I knew them was to say that I knew their names. Uh, Joey's the only one I knew with anything that resembled a real relationship. Um, but at any rate, we went and we were pretty, almost, that was pretty much everybody's story. Most of us didn't know each other. Um, everybody knew Joey. He was the one common link we all had. But at any rate, uh, we got together and um, God used Joey to uh, speak some truths into our lives that uh, it's easy to forget. Uh, because honestly, that, that's one thing I've learned in my Christian walk is that despite taking a, a lifetime of taking two steps forward, one step backwards, and then doing that cycle again, um, there are certain truths, some basic things that we just forget. And so I just kind of wanted to let you know what, what I learned at the retreat, what I got out of it, and what God is doing in me currently. And just take a minute for doing that. First thing he wanted to tell us is that we're not alone. He took us to one of my favorite passages, uh, John chapter 15, and took us there and basically said this, this commandment that Jesus gave there, that we're supposed to love one another. Jesus was talking to the disciples and, and his, his core 12. These were people who were going to be sent out to be ministers of the gospel. And so basically he's saying that whether you guys know each other at this point or not, you guys need to love each other, uh, and, and that's so very true. And the simple fact is that what he's really trying to drive in is the fact that we're not alone, and ministry is inherently a lonely thing, um, because even though you're surrounded by people most of the time, it, it's hard to find people you can be genuinely intimate with and, and um, share on a soul level with all your struggles, all the hurts. Because as much as I love you guys, honestly, some of the hurts come from you guys. I mean, that's just one sinner rubbing up against another sinner. We do that to each other. And it's easy to get hurt from that. And so it, it was good to be able to come together with other people who are in some form of ministry and be able to hear that, hey, we have a lot of the same struggles. We have a lot of the same wounds. <coughs> And uh, we're not alone. And more than that, uh, Joey pretty much pledged the resources of Stonewater, which is um, a, on the smaller side for a mega church, but it's still a mega church. Um, and they're, they're good folks over there, and uh, they've got a lot of resources that I plan on tapping in the future. Um, so there's that. Um, another thing is that he brought us to a scripture where... Uh, Jesus basically was teaching in his hometown, and um, they handed him a scroll of Isaiah, and he read out the scriptures, and I can't quote it um, off the top of my head, but he said basically, I came um, to set prisoners free, t 
to uh, oh gosh, heal the heal the wounded, uh, set free the captives, um, and for forgiveness of sins. I think um, I know I butchered that. Uh, obviously, I never took time to memorize that one. Um, I have looked at that one in the past, and I even brought it up in church, saying that basically this was Jesus's mission statement. Uh, but the thing is, is that in all that, looking at what Jesus came to do, uh, Joey pointed out that Jesus came to set me free, not just Comanche, not just my church, came to set me free. And uh, that's something that's easily forgotten, because um, we do. We, uh, uh, was it, was it Hebrews, I think, Hebrews 12 or 13, I think, uh, I forget which one. Um, no, it's 12. Uh, it says, let us lay aside every, every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run the race that Christ has set out before us. And um, simple fact is that the reason we're being told there to set aside everything that uh, weighs us down and, and the sins which tangle us up is because we pick up things that weigh us down and we get caught up in sins that tangle us up. And I'm no different in that than you guys are. And so Jesus came to set me free. Um, number three was that it's wise to ask God and others for help. And um, I know I've confessed this to you guys before. I don't like asking for help. I just don't. I, I'd rather go out and buy a, a new weed eater than borrow someone's weed eater. That's just the easiest example. I, I'd rather go out and, you know, somehow figure out how to buy a trailer instead of borrowing a trailer. I mean, just, I, I'm just, I'm wired that way. And it, I, I recognize it. it's just plain pride. It's not a good thing. Um, and so if you see me See me doing that sort of thing, um, feel free to come smack me upside the head, because I need it. But it is, it's good to ask God for help, and um, it's good to ask others for help. And so that's something I need to do. So don't be surprised if in the future I, I ask you guys for a little more help uh, than I have before. Um, number four is probably the one that of uh, the points that he raised that I struggle with the most, and that was... That God knew what he was doing when he chose me for ministry. Um, I, I don't have a seminary degree. I, I don't have, I didn't go to Bible college. I got like two years of community college. And it was nothing to do with the Bible. <laughs> um, I'm more qualified in that as far as education goes. I'm more qualified to be a computer programmer than I am a, a, a pastor. But God has brought me through a long way. And I can, I can tell you that although church planning was nowhere in my mind until the last few years when God laid it on us, um, he's been getting me ready for years. And really my, my adult life for sure. Because the oldest church I've been a part of as an adult was about 12 years old, um, which is still relatively young for a church. And there were a lot of things, like that church was a portable church. Uh, they, we met in a high school gym, and there's a real possibility, guys, that we could be doing that in a, a month or two, maybe even. Um, and so learning how to set up a sound system and chair and stages and all that stuff, kids' ministry, and pack it up again after the service is done. Um, it was a good time for me. I enjoyed getting to talk with guys while we're working together, but um, it, it's good to know stuff like that. It's good to see what pastors deal with in young churches um, and um, how you go about setting a church culture uh, to what God's laid on your heart because every church has its own personality. We call it, In church planning circles, we call that church culture. But the simple fact is every church has certain things that they're strong with and certain things they're weak with. And, and that's, that's any organization. Um, the bigger the organization is, the more we can round out those weak spots. But especially when we're this small, and we are small, <laughs> um, and we just have weak spots. And that's not a bad thing. It's just reality. 
but I've been learning my whole life how to do things like this, how to, how to work with small groups, how to do that, and um, it, including helping plant from the very start a, a church in Cleburne. And so it's been good, and it's been educational. But I can look back and I can say how God used life to educate me, but not a college uh, or a seminary or anything like that. So God knew what he was doing when he chose me for ministry. But that's something that I don't settle into well. I, I don't get that. I, I have always, always, always struggled with self-esteem, with feelings of inadequacy, that whole thing. I'm an introvert by nature. I'm not highly charismatic. You know, there's, there's guys who can go start a church, and it's like people just gravitate towards them. And I just want to shoot those people because they disgust me. Because I can't. <laughs> I don't, um, and that's okay. That that's part of the skill set, the talents that God has given them, and I won't shoot them. I promise. But it doesn't change the fact that I'm jealous of it. But God's qualified me in other ways, uniquely. And um, Live Oak Church is not going to be other churches because of that. And I'm fine with that. And I hope you are too, because um, you're stuck with it. And if you don't like it, well, I guess you can leave. <laughs> um, we will grow, and we will get better, But and I will get better. God's not done with me yet. He's still qualifying me every time. The last one is a lesson I can't tell you how many times I've learned, um, and it, it's simply this, that I can only minister from the overflow of my relationship with Jesus. Um, the only thing I have to offer you guys is Jesus. That's it. Anything Ross has to offer is garbage. Um, deposit it in that little black bin on the way out because um, that's all it's worth. It, my advice is as good as anyone else's advice. And my life was not headed a good direction before God got hold of me and I surrendered my life over to him. But simply put, I have a relationship with him. And just like you guys, there's just times I coast. Uh, it's just, you set, set things on cruise control and you just go. And that's where I've been for the last few months anyway. And I'm sorry for that because uh, I ought to, I know better. I do know better. I just forget. So uh, I, I apologize about that. Um, and so I, I'm going to be changing when I get up in the mornings from 6.30 to 5.30 and um, because I used to get up at 5.30 and I just slowly started sleeping in a little bit later because there wasn't anything pressing me to get up earlier. I just didn't need to so and I like sleep <laughs> so at any rate I just been sleeping a little bit later and a little bit later and, and um, pretty much you need to get up at 6.30 uh, in order to get my two boys to school, um, but I remember my reason for getting up at 5.30. It's because I need that time with God. I need to come up here, grab that guitar, and just play whatever song God lays on my heart, uh, because the songs, honestly, my favorite worship songs are not songs that we do here, because everything, every song we do at Live Oak because we're trying so hard to reach out into pe to the lives of people who do not go to church, who, who maybe have never gone to church, or at the very least they've been burnt by it and left it behind for whatever reason. Um, but we're trying to reach people who don't know Jesus. And so every single song we do at Live Oak carries a strong element of the good news of Jesus Christ, like reckless love, that God would leave the 99 for the one things like that. Um, but the stuff that I really thrive off of, the stuff that brings me into a place where I can feel God's presence are our songs that talk about who God is and how great he is, how holy he is, how loving he is. And it's not so much about what he's done for me. It's about who he is. And, um, and I need to get up and I need to break open my Bible and spend more time with Jesus instead of just time preparing for a sermon on Sunday.
because while that's that's time in the Bible and it has value there, it doesn't doesn't do as much to bring intimacy um, with Jesus as me getting in the Bible, stopping before I start reading, just praying, God, open my mind to whatever it is you want to teach me. I, I, I'm taking the the conscious effort right here, right now, to open my heart to whatever it is you have for me. But God, you got to show me. I need you. And nothing less will do. And so, basically it all comes down to all I have to offer you is Jesus. And if I'm not plugging into him, you guys are getting second rate. At best. And so, if you guys ever start to feel like I'm off, want you to come talk to me. Email me, call me, text me, whatever it is. But if you feel like I'm off, like it's something, he's just not where he's supposed to be. Man, sit me down. Say, hey, Ross, are, are you spending that time with God? Are, are you um, doing what it takes in order to be intimate with God? And um, the odds are pretty good the answer is going to be no at that point. Um, but I just want to encourage you guys to do that. Anyway, um, that's enough of that. Elijah, would you bring up my Bible, please? I oh, forgot it. Uh, oh. Yep. Yeah, I was um, fixing some font on some of the other songs. I uh, forgot about that. Uh, the other one, Elijah. You just passed it by. It's on the corner. Too many Bibles here. Yes. <laughs> they have their uses. <laughs> okay. So we've been going through uh, the book of John. And uh, in a way, some of what I took away from that retreat um, is working itself into what we're looking at today. Um, we're in John chapter 6, going through this basic idea that God is with us and that there are some things that only God can do. And uh, that's kind of where we are. So, I want to tell you, I guess, a little bit uh, about what I've learned in the process of church planning. Um, what I've learned is that basically you, when you're in a situation like I, I was, not really knowing anyone in Comanche when we moved here, is that you got to go out and meet people, obviously. Um, and then you've got to get people to come join you in this work. And the way you do that is by um, sharing the vision God's given you. Um, and there's going to be people who will s hear that vision and they will love it and they will sign on. And that's the kind of people you really, really want. And then there's like sometimes the people they're married to <laughs> who aren't 100% on board. They're like, yeah, okay. And you can take those people and that's, that's where they're at and that's fine. Um, but what you really need is people who have bought into the vision that God's given you. And that um, they're all in on it because they see what God can do with that. It's, it's not about me. It, it's not about you. It, it's about what God wants to do in me, in you to some degree, but also in this whole community. And we have a county of about 15,000 people. Um, and the vast majority of those people do not go to church. And as I've said before, quite honestly, I, it's my firm belief that most people who go to church aren't honestly saved. Because, as I've heard before, uh, and I'm, I can't remember who said it originally, um, or who I heard it from originally, uh, but just because you're in church doesn't make you a Christian. And it's no more than being in a garage makes you a car. It's only Sunday. The only Sunday? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I like that. Um, at any rate, the vision God gave me is basically, and this isn't the wording that I put it on on the official vision statement or anything like that, but it's basically I want Live Oak Church to be a hospital that's built with three walls leaning against the gates of hell. Because I want to be that stop right there that people, it's like, they know that that's where they're going. They're going to hell. Oh, wait, 
What's this? I'm wounded. I need help. Maybe I can get it here. I want to be that place. And that means messy lives. That means hurt individuals. And frankly, just like I said earlier, when you bring two sinners together, there's, there's wounds that take place. Um, when you bring two seriously messed up people together, much less a room full, um, there's problems that come. I mean, there just is. We're all working out our salvation to some degree or another. Um, and so that's a vision God gave me, is that we're going to be a hospital that's kind of the last stop to hell and where we're so fired up in love with God and in love with people that are walking pass us, that we're willing to take that detour, maybe even into the gates of hell, to bring somebody out. And that's what I want this church to be. Um, but this vision is something that's got to be God-given. It's got to be God-sized. It can't be something that I can do on my own, no matter how skilled I could be. It can't be something that I build. Otherwise, I've built my kingdom and I've not built the kingdom of God. And um, that's, that's a dangerous thing because people would come to something like that thinking they're taking part in something that is the kingdom of God and they're not. And they're being led astray you know, by good intentions. Um, and good intentions are not good enough. We need Jesus. Um, and, and one reason why Pretty much nobody who comes to this church with any regularity um, has a good, strong church history uh, in their whole life is that, well, over their whole life, that's what I mean, uh, is that when we've met people who are a part of First Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or, or whichever church it is and they're saying, oh, you're starting up a church and they, they sound interested and um, basically what we've had to do is basically say man, I love that you're a brother, I love that you're excited for what God's going to do with this church and what God's going to do through it in Comanche through, that church, through this church but God's got you where he wants you and um, we, if anything, we want to encourage you to dig deeper into the church you've been a part of. Because God has sent us to reach the lost. Um, and um, he's not called us to call people from one church to ours. Uh, that's never what I wanted. And I recognize that that's going to happen. There's going to be some people that are going to leave whatever other church in this town and start coming to us because whatever reason. You can ask that person what their reason is. That's going to happen. But when you're first starting things out, that's dangerous territory because they come in with expectations. They come in with a slightly different vision, whether they realize it or not, of what church should be. And that can be dangerous. And that is kind of what Jesus is dealing with here, is that people who are kind of on board or want to be on board but they just don't get the vision that Christ is trying to give them. And so um, we're going to start off here in John chapter 5, and I'm going to back up a little further. Sorry, not chapter 5, chapter 6. I'm going to back up a little bit further than where we're going to be focused in on. I'm starting verse 53. So John chapter 6, verse 53. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of his disciples said, 
This is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend into heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew which would betray him. Then he said, that is why I, why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus said, I chose the twelve of you, but one is the devil. He was speaking of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, one of the twelve who would later betray him. So right there, Jesus is dealing with a huge crowd. If you remember, not very far in front of this, we have what's commonly labeled in Bibles as the feeding of the 5,000. But it's more like the feeding of the 15,000 to 20,000. And this crowd is following him because he's been doing miracles. He's been teaching some things that people are curious about. They're, they're hearing it. They're interested. But the vast majority of this crowd really hasn't signed on. And we're starting to see the bumps in the road here. Because this crowd is following Jesus. They're wanting to see what he can do. They're wanting to hear what he has to say. And Jesus starts throwing out this message. Hey, I'm the bread that's come down out of heaven. If you don't eat my flesh, if you don't drink my blood, you have no part of me. And you just, you're, you're standing there on your own. You're not in me. You have no eternal life. And so, people hear this, and, and that's where we're digging in, is from verse 60. Many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And, um, this is where people are hearing what Jesus has to say. And Jesus is intentionally saying something that's intended, I believe, I strongly believe. He's intending to turn some of these people off. Basically saying that, you know, as much as you guys are interested, as much as you guys want some of what I have to offer, you don't want all of me. You don't want, you want me as... I fit into what you think I am. You want me as you want me to be. Because you remember, this crowd, right after he fed them, they turned around and instead of saying, thanks Jesus for a good meal, they said, thanks Jesus, you want to be the king? We can make you the king. Let's be, let's be a revolution. Let's start this. Let's kick Rome out of Israel and let's be a nation. You're going to be our king. So thanks for the good meal. Let's go fight. <laughs> and Jesus is like, it's not time yet. That, that time's coming, but it's not yet. You want me as you want me, not as I am. And if you stop and you think about it, that, that, that's largely the problem that each of us have had. And, and we've all wrestled with, and some of us are still wrestling with it. Probably all of us, if we're honest, are wrestling with it to some degree. Um, but we, we have, see, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 tells us a very powerful truth. That God made people in his image. That we are meant to reflect him. That we are meant to look like him. People are supposed to be able to look at us and see God. And yeah, we, we've kind of all messed up our lives and so that image is twisted, but that's the truth. The core truth of our existence is that we were meant to be with God. We were meant to show God to everyone that looks at us. And part of the way we've taken that image and we've twisted it is that we've done the same sort of thing. Is that what we've done is we like to create God in our image. 
you stop and you think about it, that's absolutely what we do. If we're someone who is, even in church, you, you basically you get believers who fall into one of two categories, right? There's, Jesus said that, uh, he, well, Jesus is full of grace and truth. That's John chapter 1. We behold his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Christians usually land in one of those two areas very strongly, grace or truth. And we kind of flirt with the other side, but we don't really like to live over on that other side, whichever side it is. Um, and there have been times in my life where I was very much focused on truth. And these days I land more in the grace camp. And so uh, it's our responsibility as believers to go ahead and balance that out. And instead of trying to live in one and flirt with the other, we need to plant both feet in one well, we need to plant one foot in one and one foot in the other. We need to be people of grace and truth. But the point is that we make God in our image. And so if we're a compassionate person, God's a very compassionate God. If we're a very truthful person where that truth is all that matters, then, well, that's God. We, he's, this, he's this God who just lays it down like it is, and you can take it or leave it. And... Um, there's times that he's absolutely that, and there's times he's absolutely graceful. And he knows which to lead off with every single person. There's some people who need to be smacked upside the head with the truth before they can receive God's grace. There's people who need to receive the grace. They need to see that love in action before they can take the truths in that God has for them. And only God's perfect at nailing that. And we do our best. But we still, we make God in our image. God believe, have you ever noticed that God believes what you believe? That God's voice, when he's talking to you, sounds an awful lot like yours. Have you noticed that? It's that way for me, anyway. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. God has better. Uh, and th this whole problem they're landing on is that this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? that you go back into the original language that it was that we have for it which is greek and that term accept it is really it's more like the word is a kuo okay and what what it is it's almost a military term it's strictly translated as i hear but inherent is that is not only that i hear it but that i obey it okay so it's just like drill sergeant talking to a private Private, drop and give me 20 push-ups. Sir, yes, sir. That's, it's that kind of reaction. The private heard, and he dropped, and he did the push-ups. It's the same thing. When God says something, and we hear it, we need to obey it, and we need to adjust our lives to it. But these people didn't want to do that. They wanted to, They created Jesus in this image. They had a, this idea that he ought to be some revolutionary, come to kick roam out and make their lives easy and good and he wasn't here to do that he was here to give them a job he goes on verse 61 jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining so he said to them does this offend you then what do you think or what will you think if you see the son of man ascend into heaven so basically Jesus' response to them being offended is this. If you have a problem with me telling you that I'm from heaven, then how are you going to be able to handle the confirmation of that by me ascending back into heaven? So basically, I'm telling you I'm from heaven. I'm telling you that I'm divine. How are you going to handle it then when you get confirmation? And he does exactly this later on. I mean, we, we, the disciples see him go up into heaven. Uh, that, that's confirmation for you right there. Uh, but these people were ha having a hard time just hearing it. Seeing it is a different thing. Uh, last night, uh, a couple friends brought me to a, a hunting ministry where they, uh, they bring people in from all over the state. And uh, it basically, this one was supposed to be a, is a father-daughter hunting trip. Okay. And regardless of how you feel about hunting, that, that's something, obviously, they enjoy. And um, 
some of these girls got to shoot their very first deer. Um, and uh, I fully expected to go there, knowing what was going to happen. We were going to be there after we arrived, before the girls and their dads came back with whatever they'd gotten. And I knew they were going to be cleaning the deer right there. Now, honestly, I've never shot a deer. Not that I'm totally unwilling to, but I just never have gotten around to it. But I've certainly never been around when one was clean. I wasn't 100% sure how I was going to react. Um, I'm pretty, i got a pretty strong stomach, but um, you just never know until you're in the situation when you start seeing something like that, uh, how you're going to react. And I was honestly surprised that none of the girls lost their lunch. Um, and they didn't. I don't want them. I, I was surprised. But that's, that's basically the difference between you don't know until you're there in that situation, the truth of how you're going to react. You may talk a good game and say, oh, yeah, it's not going to bother me. I'm, and then you see it, and suddenly your face turns white, and you like got to go find a bucket. Um, you just don't know. It's the same thing here. Jesus is saying, look, I've been telling you, but you have not yet experienced confirmation of it. How are you going to handle that confirmation? How are you going to be there be when it gets real? Because Jesus has been telling them this whole time, basically, without using the words, I am God, he's been telling them that. Again and again and again. And that's what these guys are wrestling with. That's what they're not comfortable with. That God could be walking right there with them. And all the implications that come with that. But he goes on. That's, that's not the only thing he's doing there. Um, so, so verse 61, does this offend you? Then what will you think when you see the Son of Man ascend into heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So basically, if after everything you've seen, after everything you've heard, all these miracles you've seen, you know, people being able to walk who couldn't walk before, you know, one kid's meal being multiplied into thousands of meals, if after everything you've seen, after everything I've been teaching you about how I am God in human flesh, if you can't handle Jesus' words that he's divine, then you can't handle the confirmation. And, and the simple fact is that the fact that God came down on earth to walk with us was the necessary step for this eternal life. And he's saying it right here. He goes on, um, the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life, but some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that's why I've said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them. And this eternal life is something that only God can give. And the way things are, the simple reality of the situation is that if you don't come to Jesus, you're not coming to God. And we have a hard time with that because we have want, we really want to make ourselves an integral part of our own salvation. And Jesus is saying, no, no, it's not up to you. That's what he's saying. That human effort accomplishes nothing. Simply put, there, there, we, want, we want to be able to receive a little checklist or a, a booklet or something we can get like says 10 steps to get to heaven or 10 steps to a right relationship with God. That's what we want because that's what we're surrounded with. That's what we build our whole lives on is what we can do, what, how what I do affects others, how what I do affects my life. We want to feel like we're in control, like we have some say in this matter. And the simple fact is that there's nothing we do that makes a difference in our salvation. Jesus told us, you got one job. I'm going to go back. It's previous in this verse. Verse 29. So chapter 6, verse 29. He says it really simply. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he sent. That's it. 
believe. That's, that one word is all it comes down to. That's our responsibility. Believe God. Believe Jesus. That's it. That's the only thing he's asking from us. He's going to take care of everything else. Every other part of our salvation rests entirely on him. And that doesn't sit well with us. We like, to, we like to have that control. We like to be able to do something about it to make it, to make it better or to make it possible. There's some step we want, and we just, it's almost completely and utterly out of our hands. It's just that belief. That's it. These people are struggling with that. Verse 66, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. I just love that response. Jesus, in chasing off literally thousands of people because they can't take what he has to offer, because they're not willing to believe. Not really. Not soul level, life changing belief. That's what God's asking for. It's not just a, oh yeah, I believe. changes us when we really believe him. And so Jesus turns to his 12 disciples, these people that he picked out by hand, each and every single one of them, and he says, what about you guys? Are you guys going to ditch out on me? And I love Simon's response. Where else is there to go? Where else can we find eternal life? We know who you are. We know you are the Holy One of God. That is the Messiah, that is God come down in human form. And Jesus said, I chose the twelve of you, but one is a devil. And he was speaking of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, one of the twelve who would later betray him. And to me, this, this immediately brought back that this idea of church planning and presenting people with vision and, and having to have people on board with the vision that God, God is giving you. And almost inevitably, what I've read hasn't happened to me so far, um, but I'm waiting for it. Basically, what's going to happen is that someone's going to come into the church, someone's going to be thrilled to be there, and they're going to be there for a while. And typically... Although you never know, every case is different. But typically what happens is that they slowly start to say, hey, what about this instead? Why, why don't we do B instead of A? Why don't we, why don't we just, and basically what they're saying is, why don't we just change this vision a little bit that God's giving you? And there's a problem with that. If I've done my job right as a church planter, then I've prayed and prayed and prayed and waited and listened for God to give me a vision. And so anything other than that vision is following someone other than God. And so basically what I was told is that when someone comes along trying to hijack the vision is what it's called. Basically, what you've got to do is you, you've got to just talk to them and say, and this is as gentle as you can be about it, hey, no, this is the vision. This is what God's given us. And if you don't like it, you need to leave. And like I said, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm waiting for it. Someone's going to come along soon. I don't know. Maybe it'll be from 10 years from now. I don't know, but someone, someone's going to do it. And my danger is that uh, I'm going to, am I going to be a point like I am today where I'm focused on what God's given me? Or am I going to be a point like I was even last week where I'm coasting and distracted and I'm not really working on that relationship with God to where I can go off track really easy because I'm not in tune with God 
it, it makes it that much harder for me to hear them because I'm not being deliberate about taking the time to spend with him. It makes it so easy for me to get off track. And, you know, I'm not the only one. That's all of us. When we're not spending time with Jesus, it's hard for us to hear him. And we all get distracted. But the difference is that where, where I get distracted, the church goes off course. And there's only one course for us. And that's whatever path that God's laid out for us. So, that's basically what it comes down to. And that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus is basically coming along. He's saying that this massive crowd that he's got following. Remember, it could be up to like 20,000 people. Probably less by now. Probably some of them have gone home. But it could be up to 20,000 people. And he basically sends away, what, 19,988 of them? Okay. Anyway, we just, those people really weren't on board. And so, because they weren't wanting to follow him. Not him as he is. Because he's telling us who he is over and over again. Throughout the book of John, but frankly all the way through the Bible. He tells us again and again, this is who I am. Are you going to sign on with him, or are you going to sign on with a God you've made in your image? Who we want God to be. And while anyone is welcome, um, we need to be a church that is absolutely focused on the direction that God has given us. And again, that comes down to pretty much being that, that hospital right on the gates of hell, where we're not afraid to to go in to those gates, pull people out if we can do it. That means maybe knocking on doors back in the bad part of town. One of our guys who's not here today uh, lives, and man, I've heard stories about his neighbors. <laughs> it's a bad neighborhood, and um, he's kind of right to be scared of his neighbors. But you know, Maybe I need to grab him and start saying, hey, let's go around. Let's start talking to these guys. Who knows? God works miracles, and that is the best miracle he works is change lives. And he does that miracle all the time. We just need to join him in it. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, I want to come to you right here. And again, I just apologize for getting distracted, for for coasting and um, just pray that you would renew me um, help me to focus on you and not get distracted just keep my eyes on you the one who who uh, authored um, my faith and you are the one who's going to perfect it thank you so much for that help Live Oak Church to be that hospital that you want it to be where anyone is welcome, where, where people are coming in and they're high and they're coming down off of that high and maybe they're barely able to pay any attention but maybe they'll catch two sentences of who you are and they'll want it and they'll realize that that's better than the drugs that they've been on. Maybe it's an alcoholic who comes in and he's hungover and we just hand him a tall glass of water and an Advil and say, hey, take a seat and relax. This is Jesus. God, we need you. We need to stay focused on you. Help us to do that and help us not settle. Because the vision you have is to affect every single life in Comanche County. I have no doubt of that. Thank you for that. Use us in whatever way you see fit, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Guys, I love you. I hope to see you next time.